Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Barbara van Schiewig. I'm the director of the Center for Internet and Society. And I'm really excited that we can welcome Brett Frischman tonight to talk about his book, Infrastructure, the Value of Shared Resources. So you might think, well, infrastructure, what ha does this have to do with technology? And that's a good question, and Brett will tell us all about it. <laughs> but I can just promise you that whether you're interested in IP or network neutrality or telecommunications, I'm sure you'll feel something, find something in this book that will, be, will speak to you. And in a way, Tim Wu at some point said, you know, once I've read infrastructure, everything looks like infrastructure to me. I can't get it out of my head anymore. And so the only final thing I want to say, my friend and colleague Marvin Amori came up with this really great comparison where he said, you know, Brad is basically the sonic use of law professors. You may not know who sonic use is, but if you read interviews with big artists, they all say they've been really influenced by sonic use. And so it's very similar with Brett. Every big network neutrality proponent you talk with, whether it's Larry Lessig or Tim Wu or my own work, we have all been very much influenced by Brett's ideas about infrastructure. And so I'm really excited that he's decided to come to us and talk about this book tonight. Thanks, Brett. Um, thanks, Barbara and Elaine and all of you uh, for being here tonight. Um, it's really an honor to be back uh, at the Center for Internet and Society to talk about infrastructure and commons again. Uh, it turns out it turns turns out that about a decade ago, Larry Lessig invited me to come, and, and I was a sort of a fledgling law professor. I just started, and he and he had me come out and talk about this these new ideas that I've been thinking about, which was non-discrimination rules uh, for infrastructure. Um, and it starts, so in a sense, it, the, the, a lot of the ideas in the book started here in this room about 10 years ago, and so it's, really, it's great to be back to talk with you about the, the final product. Um, all right, so uh, too often we take for granted the shared infrastructures that shape our lives, our relationships with each other, uh, the opportunities we enjoy, uh, the environment we share, uh, just think for a moment about the basic supporting infrastructures that you rely on daily. Right? So some obvious examples are roads, the internet, water systems, the electric power grid. Um, in fact, there are many less obvious examples, such as our uh, shared languages, legal institutions, ideas, and even the atmosphere. We depend heavily on shared infrastructure, yet it's difficult to appreciate just how much these resources contribute to our lives. It's difficult because infrastructures are complex and the benefits provided are typically indirect. Both governments and markets struggle to adequately supply the public with the infrastructure that it needs. And the reasons are many, and I'm not going to confront them all tonight, and I don't confront them all in the book. Infrastructure resources often require substantial investment to supply, maintain, and manage, and the investment has to come from somewhere. Right? So the public has to pay one way or another Raising sufficient capital to invest can be difficult. Simply put, there are a host of supply-side obstacles to efficient infrastructure provisioning, and economic analysis of infrastructure tends to focus on these issues. But one critical reason, which is generally overlooked, and which I confront at length in this book, is that infrastructure users, as voters and as consumers, may not adequately signal social demand for infrastructures. There are a host of demand side issues that we need to confront. So as you know, um, as you know, infrastructure is at the center of many contentious public policy debates, ranging from what to do about our crumbling roads and bridges to whether and how to protect our natural environment, to patent law reform, to spectrum allocation, to energy policy, to network neutrality regulation and the future of the internet. Frankly, the list could go on and on. Although the policy arenas may seem unrelated, all of them are to some extent the same. Each of these policy debates involves a battle to control infrastructure, to set the terms and conditions under which the public gets access, and to determine how infrastructure-dependent systems evolve over time. 
The battle is joined in each of these areas with some groups arguing for recourse to private property solutions and other groups arguing that such an approach would be fatal. These groups draw on a broader intellectual debate that takes place in a number of different fields, including law, economics, political science, and increasingly science and technology. On the private control side, there's a robust economic theory in support of private ordering via markets with minimal government involvement. By contrast, on the open access side, there's a frequent call for protecting the commons, but the theoretical support for this call is underdeveloped from an economics perspective. In this book, I fill this gap and advance strong economic arguments for managing and sustaining infrastructure resources as commons. And that's what I'm going to talk about with you tonight. So the first three parts of the book develop a general theoretical framework for examining the social value of shared infrastructure. The framework itself is not tailored to a particular type of infrastructure. Instead, it's based on functional economic analysis of the characteristics of infrastructure. And then the final three parts of the book apply that framework to many different types of infrastructure, exploring nuanced trade-offs that arise in particular contexts, as well as unappreciated common issues that cut across different contexts. So here's what I plan to do today. I want to briefly provide some background to help explain why I'm talking about infrastructure and commons together. And then I'm going to focus on what's the heart of the book in, in chapters four and five, where I develop a framework for identifying infrastructural resources and then evaluating the case for commons management. And finally, I'll turn to the highly contentious network neutrality debate, make a few controversial arguments, suggest a rather strong network neutrality rule and in q and I'm happy to talk about any of the chapters sort of in the table of contents. I'm happy to talk more about net neutrality or, or other areas where you think the, the ideas might apply. So first, a little background, though. So when I say infrastructure, it generally conjures up the notion of a large-scale physical resource made by humans for public consumption. Things like highways, telephone networks, and public utilities. So I want to consider three generalizations about traditional infrastructure, these kinds of resources. The first is that the government has played and continues to play a significant and widely accepted role in ensuring the provision of many traditional infrastructure. Its role certainly varies by country, by community, by resource, but the government's role as provider, subsidizer, coordinator, or, and or regulator of traditional infrastructure provision remains intact in most communities throughout the world. And the reason why is that left alone, infrastructure markets often fail. And they fail in a variety of different ways that we want to pay attention to. All right, second basic generalization is that traditional infrastructure generally are managed as a commons. In short, the resource is accessible to all within a community regardless of who you are or what you're planning to do. Access to and use of, use of most infrastructure resources are not prioritized based on who you are or what you're planning to do, except for in very special cases, such as the narrowly defined priority given to a police officer driving down the road with her siren blaring and her lights on. Right? So I focus on non-discriminatory sharing. The community for most infrastructure is the public at large. So that, in some ways, this contrasts with the definition of commons that we use in the sort of the Ostrom, those of you who are familiar with the Eleanor Ostrom uh, literature. All right, so the third generalization is that traditional infrastructure generates significant spillovers that result in large social gains. Now, most economists and policymakers and even citizens recognize that infrastructure are important to society precisely because they give rise to large social gains above and beyond what can be captured or measured in markets. The nature of some of those gains as spillovers may explain why we take infrastructure for granted. The externalities are sufficiently difficult to observe or measure quantitatively, much less capture in economic transactions, and the benefits may be diffuse and sufficiently small in magnitude to escape the attention of the individual beneficiaries. So one of the central objectives of the book is to explore the relationship among these three generalizations. Government markets fail in a variety of different ways. The role of commons management for infrastructural resources 
and the role that it might play in generating spillovers. Okay. Uh, Carol Rose once wrote about this in a, in a sort of a seminal article and called it the comedy of the commons as opposed to the tragedy of the commons with which most people are familiar. Now, at times people have become confused about the thesis, believing it to be summed up by a catchphrase, if infrastructure, then commons. That's what Frischman says. It's not what I say. That's not, what the, that's not the thesis of the book, and I want to be very clear that it's just the structure of the argument. Right? It's, a, it's an organizing principle. So chapter four focuses on infrastructure as a type of resource, a resource set. And chapter five focuses on commons management as a type of resource management strategy. Right? So resources within the set, we want to th when we have resources that are within the, within the set, we want to think about whether or not that strategy makes sense. It doesn't always make sense. Sometimes it does. OK. So let's turn our attention to question what qualifies as infrastructure. So infrastructure resources satisfy the following three criteria. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, but before I do, I want to make clear that the criteria work together to delineate a set of resources that are functionally infrastructural. Now, there are some resources that you might think of as infrastructure, let's say an oil reserve, that are clearly outside the scope of this set. Why? Because an oil reserve is rivalrously consumed. Right? Every unit you consume depletes the amount available for the next person. Right? Always positive marginal costs for when you're talking about consumption. So oil reserves are not infrastructure for purposes of this book. Similarly, there's a bunch of things that you might think of as clearly not infrastructure, like ideas or ecosystems or the atmosphere or law, that do, in fact, fall within the scope of this definition because they're infrastructural in terms of the way that we functionally relate to these resources. OK, so the first criterion uh, helps us identify that infrastructure are either pure or impure public goods. Non-rivalry over some appreciable range of demand opens the door to widespread shared access and productive use of the resource. And by not, those of you not familiar with the economic concepts, non-rivalry refers to sort of marginal cost of zero. Right? Consuming the resource does not de deplete the amount available for someone else, and so you've got a marginal cost of zero, infinite capacity to share. So really, in short, the first criterion describes the shareable nature of the infrastructure. Sharing is technologically feasible. Now, this presents an important, though often overlooked and underappreciated, opportunity. Non-rivalry can be leveraged for a variety of purposes. Now, the second and third criteria focus on the manner in which infrastructure creates social value, in a sense, on how non-rivalry can be leveraged. So these criteria move beyond the public goods classification. In other words, we're talking about a special set of public goods. And they raise additional demand side implications. Societal demand for infrastructure's derived demand. So whether we're talking about a transportation system, the electricity grid, ideas, environmental uh, ecosystems, the internet. The bulk of the social benefits generated by these resources derives from their downstream uses, the uses to which people put those infrastructure. They're means to other ends. They're not ends in and of themselves. Okay? Infrastructure are generic or general purpose inputs, and the range of outputs can span private, public, and social goods. So infrastructure are not special purpose resources optimized for a particular user or use to satisfy demand derived from a da particular downstream market. Right? So an electricity grid, for example, delivers power to the public, supporting an incredible Incredibly wide range of uses, users, markets, and technologies. It's not specially designed or optimized for a particular use, user, or downstream market. It provides non-discriminatory service for a toaster and a computer, for staples and a pizzeria, and the same can be said about the national highway system or the internet. These resources provide basic functionalities and both support and structure more complex systems of user activities, but they don't determine them. Users determine what to do with the capabilities that infrastructure provide. Genericness implies a range of capabilities, options, opportunities, and even freedoms. 
Users decide what roads to travel, where to go, and, what, and who to visit. Users choose their activities. They can choose to experiment or to innovate. They can decide whether and what to build. Users decide how to use their time and other complementary resources. To understand societal demand for infrastructure and how values actually created in the real world, we need to pay much closer attention to the user activities and what it is that users produce. The third criterion emphasizes the production of public and social goods. And the reason why is that when infrastructure supports these productive activities by users, there are good reasons to question how well markets will work in assessing demand and consequently supplying the infrastructure that we need. A gap between private and social demand arises. And the reason for the gap is relatively straightforward. Infrastructure users' willingness to pay, that is this blue line, Right? It reflects their private demand, the value they expect to realize upon gaining access and using the, the resource. It doesn't take into account the value that others might realize as a result of their use. That is, it doesn't account for the external effects associated with the production of public and social goods. Difficulties in measuring and appropriating value generated in output markets translates into a problem for infrastructure suppliers, and consequently for the public. This demand manifestation problem can affect infrastructure allocation, design, investment, and management. Society may want, need, or depend upon infrastructure use to a substantial degree more than private demand would suggest. And this raises two sets of related social or market failure concerns. First, our concerns about undersupply and underuse of the infrastructure, and, and consequently, undersupply of infrastructure dependent public and social goods. Second, our concerns about dynamic shifts in the nature of the infrastructure resource over time. Now, both of these concerns can be uh, understood roughly by comparing these private and social demand curves. So, the private demand curve reflects users' willingness to pay. It effectively ranks individual uses of the infrastructure according to private value from left to right. The social demand curve, the red line, right, that's a demand curve shifted up from the private demand curve to reflect the aggregate spillovers that comprise the difference between social and private value. Now there's a temptation to draw the social demand curve with the same shape as a private demand curve. Doing so assumes each user generates an identical spillover, at least in magnitude. Okay? This is a rather conventional economic approach, sort of textbook approach, sort of describing an externality and what it looks like. <clears throat> now, in the book, I explain that this is entirely inappropriate in the context of infrastructure. It may be the case that willingness to pay and the magnitude of an externality are correlated in some contexts, but there's no reason a priori to assume such a correlation, and making such an assumption can be incredibly misleading and distorting of your analysis. Frankly, the, the social demand curve can diverge substantially from that of the private demand curve, because there's no necessary or obvious relationship between the private and social value of different users' use of the infrastructure. Now, we can take this one step further and construct demand curves based on infrastructure uses or activities or markets based on the aggregated demand for different uses. Right? So we're adding up what individuals would be willing to pay for different activities or uses of the infrastructure. Okay? This allows us to uh, focus on variance among different uses. So the private demand curve, this is this blue step function, effectively ranks uses or activities or markets by private demand. So this is sort of a market valuation of different uses or activities or market, downstream markets. Okay? Now, following the sort of conventional approach, we might construct our social demand curve by, by shifting the curve upwards, right? This suggests that there's some social value or spillovers involved, right? But infrastructure can be used to produce a wide variety of public or social goods. It's hard to know what the social demand curve would look like. It could be this. It could be that use type 6, the one for which people are, have the lowest pay, is the one that generates substantial spillovers. It's really socially valuable, lots of externalities from that particular activity. Right? Of course, if it is this, 
the solution to the market failure problem is relatively straightforward, right? Direct subsidies, that particular use type. If you can identify the users, you might be able to target that problem. But of course, it might look like this. Do I have another one? No. Right? We don't know what the social demand curve looks like. There's no reason, there's no basis for presuming it looks a particular way. Where there's uncertainty about the social demand curve, it's important that there is, that there are spillovers, that there's a divergence. But it's as important, for reasons I'll explain in a few minutes, it's as important that the shape of it is hard to know. Maybe even unknowable. But before I get there, I want to I want to consider two ways in which there are these divergences. Why do we get these differences in value? Why is it we have a difference between the private value and the social value of a certain use type, certain activity? Okay. So I want I'm going to describe two extremes. There's a middle ground. First, the amount by which social value exceeds the private value might be driven by the magnitude of the external effect generated by a particular user-generated public or social good. Right? So there might be some infrastructure-enabled activity that generates substantial spillovers by virtue of the nature of the good produced. So think of the killer app. You all know the killer app, what that is, right? So it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to predict what the killer app's going to be, much less who's going to produce it. But when it comes along, we're all very happy that it did because it generates substantial benefits above and beyond what we would possibly have, have guessed. That's one extreme. Sec on the other extreme, social surplus can derive from a large number of outputs that generate spillovers on a much smaller scale. It's not the magnitude of the effect from each good that gets produced that drives the analysis, but rather it's the number of people participating in the activity. Small scale externalities can add up to a significant social surplus when the activity is widespread. Okay, so I'm going to use a relative, so this is all abstract econ stuff, right? You guys, you might, eyes may be glazing over at this time of night. So let me try to use a relatively straightforward example that most people are familiar with. How many of you guys have seen this, this website called YouTube before? Only three people raised their hand <laughs> at the Stanford Center. For, okay, wait, might need a new example. Anyway, so YouTube videos, as the example I use in the book, it, I use it in talks because it's a pretty simple illustration of both the small scale and the killer app phenomenon I just described. Right? So many videos on YouTube are intended for incredibly small audiences. They reach a slightly larger audience. So for example, suppose I post a video of my three kids, they're incredibly cute and they're very funny, singing and dancing. I might send a link to my family and friends and expect the video to be viewed by, let's say, 25 people. Right? Perhaps 100 people actually visit, watch, and enjoy the video. Right? This would generate small-scale spillovers for 75 extra people, an additional little bit of benefit. YouTube might capture some of the benefits, but the benefits are irrelevant to my own decision to produce and share the video, this public good. Now, the benefits are incidental, and they might seem to all of you like small potatoes. But they add up considerably when millions of people participate in this activity on a, regular pace, on a regular basis. A lot of small potatoes being produced by millions of people on a regular basis is a lot of potatoes. Now, every once in a while, a user-generated video attracts millions of viewers and becomes a cultural phenomenon. Now, I'm going to use a dated example. You can substitute any more recent example that you like. How many of you have seen the Howard Davies car, Charlie Bit My Finger Again video? Only, okay, it's, you should watch. This is funny. So there is a site called YouTube, which you should all check out. Only three of you raised your hands before. And those of you who haven't seen this video, go check it out. It's pretty funny. Um, so uh, this is the example that I like to use. The video is intended for one person, the boy's godfather, who lived in the United States. So he takes a, he takes a video of his, of his kids in the, in the UK, posts the video, so intended for one person. Unexpectedly, it goes viral. And it's been, it's been visited hundreds of millions of times. It's generated all kinds of social co uh, commentary and engagement back and forth. People talking about the video. A lot of people like it. Some people don't like it. That one video generated enormous spillover. Social value above and beyond what the poster possibly could have anticipated or is capable of appropriating. All right, so we've got these two examples, two extremes. Now, Critically, neither the government nor the market would have selected or provided the, the support for either ex-ante. 
yet we're you know, kind of happy that we, we got both. And there, you, again, you can substitute examples of your own. The bottom line is that an open video sharing platform provides users with a basic capability. It keeps social options open. When users choose to exercise that capability, they presumably do so because it sufficiently satisfies their own self-interest. And heck, they also, incidentally, generate spillovers because they've shared a public good. Hey, it's a win-win for society. We should look for win-wins whenever we can, right? So I've described two extremes. There's a middle ground as well. My, my point is just to illustrate different ways that values in fact created on these platforms or on these infrastructures. And I also want to make clear that YouTube itself is just one of many, many examples that you can find online. Read Barbara's book or Benkler's book or someone else's book if you want a bunch of others. Or read my book. But there's also tons offline. It's not this uniquely internet phenomenon, the idea that basic capabilities provided by open, non-discriminatory infrastructure let people do lots of different things that generate value for others. In fact, it's a regular phenomenon. Okay, now, of course, economists have long, I should have, had, I should have a different slide, I should have that one with the little green bump, because economists have long recognized there's a case for subsidizing public goods producers because the market undersupplies these goods. So if we knew the curve was that green curve, we knew there's a lot of value from use type six, we might direct subsidies towards it, right? But that, that approach to dealing with public goods and social goods problems often fails for a variety of reasons. Govern has to assess demand. They've got to figure out which public and social goods are worth supporting. They've got to figure out which of the many producers they've got to subsidize. In many cases, it might be better to focus on infrastructure as an indirect means of supporting public and social goods producers. Now, there are, so there are a bunch of demand side concerns in that sense. There's also concerns about private infrastructure, how private infrastructure providers will manage the infrastructure over time, its evolution. So to the extent that infrastructure can be optimized or prioritized by design for particular applications, which is often the case, there's a risk that infrastructure suppliers will favor applications that generate more readily appropriable benefits, things they can capture. Now, the bias towards infrastructure uses that generate appropriate value is a direct, predictable, uh, and quite natural consequence of the ordinary operation of the market system. To be clear, this is a feature, not a bug, of the market system. To be, uh, we expect encourage, and encourage firms and entrepreneurs and other market participants to behave in this fashion. It's not wrong. They're just pursuing what we hope they pursue in markets. When feasible, firms will manage infrastructure evolution through prioritization of investments, design choices, access to various user communities, and so on. And they're going to do so to maximize expected value to the firm and its shareholders, not to society. Now, whether or not this basic fact should lead you to conclude it's a societal problem worthy of attention or government intervention is a completely different matter, the evaluation of which depends upon the infrastructure, the context, and a variety of other considerations. But you should recognize that the bias exists. Now, why does this matter? I want to go back to this just for a second. Why does this matter? Why does the fact that we have different demand curves, that not only that we have spillers, but that where they're going to come from and what they're going to be is often unknown, if not, it may even be unknowable? Well, it makes it very hard to, to directly tar target the market failure problem. Right? So if we start out with infrastructure that has this potential, we worry that both statically and dynamically, right, that we're going to end up with allocation and design of the infrastructure that turns it into commercial infrastructure, where it's optimized or it's being allocated or prioritized for a narrower range of outputs, or even becomes a special purpose input. There are static and dynamic market failures that are driven by the demand side concerns. They're not mitigated. This is, this is important for net neutrality. It's important for a lot of different things. They're not mitigated by competition. They're not mitigated by making prioritization a user choice. Why? Both competition and user decisions about prioritization are, are dependent upon private demand. That's no different than saying we want to allocate and design and make investments based on that blue, those blue lines, the private demand curve. They don't solve the problem. Doesn't mean that the problem requires intervention. That's a tough 
issue to, to confront. Depends on the context. But you can't just say competition will solve it or making you, letting users choose will solve it. Because it doesn't. It doesn't get, get rid of the demand side issue. All right, I've, I've spent a lot of time on uh, chapter four trying to think about infrastructure and these demand side market failures um, and, and, the, and the case for, and I want to turn a little bit to the case for commons management. Um, so when I talk about commons management, I'm talking about non-discrimination non or no discrimination based on the identity of the user use and the allocation of the infrastructure to various users and user activities. Right, so it's sort of operating as, I've just, as, as it looks like right up there. It's a governor or management regime with respect to the infrastructure resource itself. Managing infrastructure as a commons may be a more effective, albeit blunt, means for supporting the production of various public and social goods. Although it's not a direct subsidy, it effectively creates cross subsidies and eliminates the need to rely on either the market or the government to pick winners. It also has, so it deals with both government failure and market failure. It's important to appreciate that. Commons management isn't just government intervening to sort of stop a market failure. It's also a way of avoiding a government failure and choosing how to allocate government resources. Okay. Um, it also has dynamic implications apart from cross subsidies. It maintains flexibility in the generic nature of the infrastructure and thus addresses the persistent and systematic uncertainty about which uses or users will generate social value in the future. So in the book, I discuss this in terms of options theory and develop a, a, a new idea, I think, about a social option, where the uncertainty has to do with where the social value is going to come from, not just uncertainty about market value. And in some ways, uncertainty about market value, certainty or uncertainty about market value and, and social value can be in conflict. Okay, and I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A, but I know that timing-wise, I want to get to the Q&A. So in order to do that, I'm going to jump. Um, I'm going to go to net neutrality now, but I want to make clear just before I do that there are lots of complications, counter-arguments, things to consider in context. Chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the book carefully deal with and analyze the potential impact of non-discrimination rules or commons management on things like infrastructure pricing, supply side incentives to invest, and congestion. Happy to talk about those issues. They're, they're discussed in the book. Um, but I want you to know that it's not just about these demand side issues. There's other issues to deal with. All right, so here's the outline of the chapter in the net neutrality. I'm going to mainly focus on uh, B2 and uh, a little bit of C and a little bit of D. All right, but much of the chapters focus on this question. So in the, fa in the past few decades, the internet's grown to become an integral part of society, our economy, our daily lives. It's transformed and continues to transform various information and communications dependent systems. That is our economic, cultural, political, and other systems, social systems. So consider how the internet provides and shapes the opportunities of individuals, firms, households, governments, and other organizations to interact with each other and participate in various social systems. The scale and scope of possible and actual social interactions alone is staggering. And it's easy to take such routine benefits for granted as is commonplace for infrastructure, but we shouldn't. We should pay attention to them. So again, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about what makes the internet valuable. The bottom line is there's lots of things. It's user generation of public and social goods generates a lot of value that we tend to overlook. And a lot of that value is not all of it's online. A lot of it occurs offline. There's impacts off the net from activities that occur on the net. All right, so in the book, I talk about the five-layer model. There's many different layered models of the internet. The, the net neutrality chapter really focuses on the infrastructure layer at the bottom uh, and sort of the way in which uh, uh, net neutrality would create, you know, would sustain commons management in terms of the infrastructure layer's relationship with applications, content, and social layers above it. Um, I do want to point out, though, that there are infrastructural resources in those other layers. There's infrastructural applications. There's infrastructural content. Read chapter 12 on intellectual infrastructure if you're interested in, in thinking about 
those issues. But this chapter deals with net neutrality. It's focused on the basic infrastructure, that lower layer, the physical networks. All right, so at the heart of the, the debate in net neutrality is whether the internet infrastructure will continue to be managed as a commons. You know, commitment, you know, voluntary, voluntary adoption of, of TCP IP and commitment to an end-to-end -end architecture has more or less given us an infrastructure managed as a commons. But that's not fixed in law. Things are changing. Technology and business practice are changing and challenging whether or not that would remain uh, intact. And so the basic policy issue to be resolved is whether the government should prohibit or regulate discrimination by networks. By networks, I'm referring to the physical infrastructure layer itself. In the book, I propose a rather stringent rule that government should prohibit discrimination based on the identity of the user or use. And I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to say a little bit about um, a few ways in which I think the debate is completely distorted. The policy debate that takes place in DC, takes place in the press, takes place in the academic literature is distorted. It's misframed. And in the book, I'd make the claim that infrastructure theory can help reframe it properly. But let me tell you how it's misframed. So antitrust and regulatory economics misframes the debate. Antitrust and regulatory economics suggest that government interventions only needed when markets are not competitive, and that even when markets are competitive, interventions only justified in very narrow circumstances when demonstrable harm to consumers uh, uh, can be shown and not outweighed by efficiency gains. The focus on competition and demonstrable harm to consumers is completely misguided. I love competition. I don't like harming consumers. Don't get me wrong. But those aren't the basis. That, that's not the argument about why we, what we need or want net neutrality. It distorts the debate dramatically and distracts participants from the more important fundamental question, which is what type of internet environment our society demands. So I, I highlight three ways in which the debate's distorted, and they're related to each other. The first is that the antitrust and regulatory economics framework views the internet as a mere supply chain, just a series of markets supplying something to the next market until you reach this end consumer, which is all of us. More sophisticated version of the supply chain view incorporates so-called two-sided markets, where economists put networks in between application and content providers on one hand and consumers on the other, and they consider whether networks can efficiently mediate transactions between one side and the other. But one way or another, an incredibly complex open system is reduced to an inappropriately simple closed system for purposes of analysis, evaluation, and policy making. These views assume away incomplete and missing markets associated with public and social goods. Despite their prevalence in the actual internet environment we experience, the internet simply is not a supply chain or cannot be reduced to a two-sided market without uh, obscuring what's actually most important about the internet. Second, antitrust and regulatory economic framework leads to a misconception of the relevant actors and their involvement. It creates a false distinction between application and content providers and then other end users or consumers. But users produce a wide variety of private, public, and social goods. They produce, including various applications and content. Here I'll be controversial. Google is just an end user, like you, me, or anyone else. Now, we're different in some ways, for example, in the amount of traffic and revenue we currently generate, but not necessarily in a way that matters or ought to matter to the net neutrality debate. I, you, or anyone else could be the next Google, and that's a desirable feature of the internet. Finally, I think the debate's fixated on this what I call a competition red herring. To cut to the chase, even if we assume we have robust competition in infra infrastructure markets, I don't really believe it, but anyway, just assume it. It doesn't matter. The case for net neutrality remains quite strong. Competition alone does not alleviate any of the demand side concerns. It doesn't assure us of an efficient allocation of resources. It doesn't assure us of an internet environment that maximizes social welfare. Competition doesn't address these interests for essentially the same reason that antitrust law is orthogonal to environmental law. Anti 
antitrust law doesn't address market failures associated with externalities, whether they're environmental pollution, that is negative externalities, or the production, sharing, and productive reuse of public and social goods, that is positive externalities. Competition is just, it's, 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 orth, it's similarly orthogonal to the basic question that often matter. So as I've discussed, the conventional economic solution to the underproduction of public and social goods doesn't work very well in this context because of the incredible variety of producers and the incredible variety of public and social goods that we experience every day. In other words, the net neutrality is and must be complicated. It shouldn't be reduced to a competition policy framework. It has to deal with demand side issues. Now, the internet enables the production of a wide variety of private, public, and social goods. Certainly, the supply chain view of the internet captures the commercial nature of the internet, the generation and, and generation of private goods and transactions regarding private goods. And without a doubt, the value of the internet as a commercial infrastructure is immense. But, I would argue, the value of the internet as a public and social infrastructure dwarfs its value as commercial infrastructure. Now, I recognize it's incredibly difficult to substantiate such a crazy claim with empirical data that purports to measure value, but frankly, I think that's a problem with our current tools for measuring value. Consider again what makes the internet valuable to society. It's tied to the range of capabilities provided to individuals, firms, households, governments, and so on. Commerce, community, culture, education, government, health, politics, science, these are all information and communications intensive systems the internet's transforming and the transformation is taking place at the ends where people are empowered to participate and they're engaged in valuable productive activities. So in the book I provide an extensive discussion of these activities and talk about the wide range of public and social goods. I want you to appreciate that the transformative aspects and the spillovers occur online and offline. The system's open, it's not closed, it's not all captured online. So I argue that the demand side case for managing the internet as a commons remains quite strong, and I end up, what am I doing at time? I'll wrap up in a few minutes. And, and, I, and, I, and I argue in favor of a relatively simple rule for non-discrimination. It might seem overly strong, I know that Barbara doesn't like parts of it, right? It appears to rule out a significant range of activities some might regard as reasonable network management. But of course, it depends on what you think that label really applies to. The rule primarily precludes certain fine-grained forms of price discrimination, quality discrimination, and prioritization. It does not prohibit more efficient methods of managing congestion, such as traditional usage-sensitive pricing or congestion pricing. The proposed rule effectively functions as a social option which I argue makes economic sense because of the persistent and systematic uncertainty about the future sources of both market and social value. And the incredible confidence of some network providers about where the value is going to come from. Disabling identity-based price discrimination is not necessarily costless, but you should not assume it to be costly either, despite claims made in the debate. The two principal advantages of price discrimination are increased output and thus reduced deadweight losses and increased profits that might improve incentives to invest. Frankly, neither of these potential advantages appears to be nearly as significant as rhetorically claimed in the debate. In addition, opponents of net neutrality also suggest that identity-based discrimination or prioritization is maybe an efficient or necessary way to manage traffic on networks, and in particular, they point to managing congestion and managing unlawful, hazardous, or harmful traffic. Neither of these arguments, in my view, is terribly convincing either. There are plenty of effective means for dealing with congestion that don't involve discrimination or prioritization, and perversely, permitting discrimination may encourage infrastructure owners to maintain a state of persistent congestion. Now, to my knowledge, and I could be convinced otherwise on this, managing unlawful, hazardous, or otherwise harmful traffic can often be handled from the ends without discrimination by infrastructure providers. To the extent that I am convinced otherwise, I'm more than happy to sign on to narrowly crafted exceptions rather than tolerating broad reasonableness exceptions. So, to wrap up, infrastructure analysis with its focus on the demand side issues, 
And the function of commons management reframes the net neutrality bait, adds a weight on the scale in favor of sustaining end-to-end -end architecture and open infrastructure. It points towards a particular rule and it, encourage a compar it encourages a comparative analysis of various solutions to congestion and su supply side issues as they arise. I acknowledge that there are competing considerations and interests to balance, and I acknowledge that's why there's a question mark on the balance. I acknowledge that measuring the weight on the scale is difficult. It might not be as big of a blue box, it might be bigger. Right? It's difficult, it might even be impossible. Nonetheless, I maintain the weight substantial. The social value attributable to an open, mixed infrastructure is immense, even if immeasurable. The basic capability the internet provides, the public and social goods produced regularly by users, the transformations occurring on and off the network are all indicative of such value. Thanks. Hi. I just Hi. wanted to say thanks. And also, um, just as a basic clarification question, sure. I wonder if you could elaborate more on exactly what you're picturing when you say social option. You're describing something like preserving flexibility or um, preserving society's ability to make choices later once they've identified where that spike is in social surplus. Um, yes, so that's good. Thank you. Good. That's a good. It's a great question. Um, it is. Ma it's preserving flexibility. It's preserving uh, society's ability to make choices later. But we're not necessarily committed to making a choice. Right? It may very well be the case that, it's, that we don't end up knowing what the curve looks like and we maintain a, you know, a, the state of, we maintain the option you know, over the long run. Uh, of course, if we find out that, you know, that we want to prioritize or optimize on good information, then we, we can. not uh, The idea behind the social option, so the normal option theory, the way of thinking about option theory is normally focused on the market valuation. So if I'm a firm, I'm deciding whether or not to specialize on a product or a platform that I'm developing. Um, uh, or uh, the, to the extent that I'm uncertain about which future direction to go, right, there's value in maintaining that flexibility. Um, but there's the, the argument about a social option sort of just takes that same theory and says, well, we might also, from a societal perspective, not know um, we might be very confident about what the future market value will be. We may very well know that uh, video on demand is the, this is at least what people think, I, I, but some people think in the industry. We might think video on demand, that is the future source of value, market value. Let's optimize, right? So the option theory focuses on that market value. It may lead you to think it's time to optimize. We actually have, we've reduced uncertainty. We kind of know where the money is where the profits are going to be made, what's going to generate the most consumer welfare. But the social option theory is to say, well, to the extent that, it, that I'm right, that there are some uses that generate spillovers that aren't captured in markets. In other words, there's missing markets or there's incomplete markets that are at stake. Right? We, may have, we may be very uncertain about where the social value is, but very certain about the market value, in which case private infrastructure owners are going to have an uh, incentive to optimize prematurely from a societal perspective, although from a private perspective, it makes perfect sense to optimize. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the idea. Two parts. Uh, first is, you say you don't like to differentiate between different uses. Now on the internet, it seems to me that I'd prefer to have a doctor who's running a surgery at the other end of the internet have a higher priority than uh, the C who bites my finger. Are you just saying that magically we have so much internet uh, capability that this isn't a bother? And secondly, which is related to that, if we don't rate it on business on the real market, how do we decide to quadruple the internet bandwidth as opposed to building 15 better or refurbishing 15 bridges? How do we make these decisions if you're just telling us there's a magic social good out there, which I believe, but I don't know how to deal with it. Right. Um, 
If I knew the right spell, I would, I would rely on the magic response, but I, I, I don't. It's not magic. Um, both are both good questions. So it's true that there may be applications out there for that uh, are uh, on a non-discrimination regime uh, would be better off if you could, in fact, prioritize traffic, right? Um, uh, so there's a cost to non-discrimination. Absolutely, right? You may be reducing incentives to innovate for some kinds of applications that would be better off there prioritized. Um, Now, I think historically, there's been that's been a uh, sort of a, uh, a flag raised often, and oftentimes, you know, it, uh, in, in, you know, is early in the '90s is it be, being about IP telephony. We won't have IP telephony. We can't prioritize. Well, we 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 can, and or we can't have video conferencing, but we can. You know, and, and there is innovation push to the ends to deal with some of the things that apparently you, know, you wouldn't think could be done unless you got priorities. That's one response. Like you can actually force innovation at the application layer to actually get that to happen. To the extent that you can't, you can also do that it, not over the internet. Right? You don't have to have the internet be the, the backbone for all communication across society. So to the extent that there is a ton of demand for high-end medical services that can only be done remotely, that you need in real time, and for which you can't get adequate service because the risk of congestion would throw it all off. So you need prioritization. It needs to be perfect, a certain level of quality of service. Um, to the extent that those applications have that much demand, right? it may be that you, you do that on private networks rather than going over the public internet. Right? So that's one part of the response. The second question is great. Right? The second question is, um, if, I, if I was getting it right, which is uh, how do we decide in terms of a portfolio of infrastructure investments, which infrastructure investments to make? Given that, now, I don't think the market tells us a good, gives us a good answer either. Basing it on the market valuation doesn't tell us Exactly, it doesn't guarantee us that we're getting the best investments in terms of infrastructure investment. In fact, it leads us, skews us in one, you know, pretty heavily in one direction. Your response is, okay, if we understand that there are some infrastructures that generate large spillovers, and, but how do we choose among them? And that's, that's a good, I don't have a very solid answer on sort of how the government, so in, it depends, I'm gonna say it depends on the context, it depends on the community, it depends on the kind of infrastructure investment you're talking about. If I'm trying to compare, do we have, you know, are we going to invest in roads versus rail versus telecom? I think that's that's not. A, I don't have an answer. Sort of how to choose among infrastructure at, at that level right now. Um, but I do think that one. I, I'm pretty happy relying on private infrastructure providers. My my position is not that on the so I'm dealing with the demand side. My position is not that on the supply side. We should turn it all over to we should turn it all over to government. Every government has to provide all infrastructure directly because we can't rely on private markets to apply this. I don't think that's true. I think there's lots of infrastructure that can be privately provided, subject to a common carriage or a non-discrimination rule, and there still are profits to be made, and there are still it's still a worthwhile investment, right? It's not clear to me that incentives to invest in infrastructure are undermined in the vast majority of contexts by having a non-discrimination rule. That's one. I mean, so. I think where there's private, where there's demand in private markets to build infrastructure, then you can rely on private, private actors to build it. I think to the extent that you've got demonstrable shortage of interest in built out infrastructure, then the case is made for, a, there's a bunch of different ways the government can in, intervene to deal with supply side problems. One way is to provide it directly, municipal entry into broadband, uh, but it, it, building roads. Another way to do it is to invest directly in the R&D that lowers the cost of entry which we do all the time, but we kind of forget that that's what we're doing. Right? Much of the built, privately built infrastructure rides on massive public investments in the technologies that allow it to be built in the first place. Um, we could also give tax incentives if we want to sort of leverage ta the tax system for investments in certain, there's a lot of different ways we can go about it. So I mean, uh, but that's a great, it's a great question. How do we choose among the portfolio of investments is a really tricky question. I don't have a, I don't have a solid answer for it right now. But I don't think it's magic. That's what I think. <laughs>
uh, as I stand here, thank you, by the way, as I stand here, I think you may have answered um, some element of my question. Um, I, I was um, hearkening back to the example you gave with uh, YouTube and the, uh, the social value that's created and sort of the unexpected social value by hundreds of thousands of views as opposed to the expected uh, perhaps one or 25. Um, and, then the, uh, and then comparing that to the framing of net neutrality from the myopic perspective as commercial, and it occurred to me that although we as users of YouTube see social value, um, the market, the, the, the company that creates and provides the infrastructure for YouTube, which isn't a government but a, but a company, um, sees hundreds of thousands of eyeballs to sell to uh, advertisers, that it's not, from their perspective, uh, and as it should be, not um, socially good to create YouTube so that you ought to be able to share Matthew's birthday party. It's an opportunity for them to harvest and sell eyeballs. And to the extent that they could sustain a marketplace to do that, they're going to do that. And now I'm thinking, but wait, that's the myopic view of the internet, but that's also the economic reality of the internet. So how, how do you make that leap? Well, oh, so it's interesting. I, I would have used your example, right? If I was nimble, I would have used that as my answer to the previous question, right? So that, look, private, Google's a great example of a private market participant that believes that we don't have to capture all the surplus. We can't capture all the surplus, but we're going to invest in open infrastructure, open systems, right, that allow people to generate value as long as we're getting enough of a, uh, you know, money back through advertising to, uh, you know, to, to make it worth our, worth our while. Right, so you have you again. It's just a one. YouTube is just an example of an open infrastructure platform provide at the applications layer, built by a private party that doesn't need to capture all of the value. Um, I don't think it. I don't. I was a little bit confused by the question about it, why that's the myopic view. I don't think it's the my, the myopic view I was talking about is the antitrust and regulatory economics framework says leads us to think about um, the net neutrality debate in particular. Think about these issues as. Let's just rely on, if we have competition, we've got nothing to worry about because consumers will get what we want through competitive markets. But we systematically won't get what we want if we just rely on competitive markets because private demand and competitive markets won't lead to the kinds of infrastructure investments that we want. Right, so that, I mean, so that, that the, it doesn't mean that competitive markets don't sometimes give us the infrastructure they want. It, sure they do. There's lots of examples of privately provided infrastructure. In fact, you know, you can think about, uh, you know, so the chapter 12 of the book is about intellectual infrastructure and ideas. I generate a lot of infrastructure in this book, a bunch of ideas that are infrastructural. But hey, getting, you know, there is, so chapter 8 is about sufficient incentives. There's sufficient incentives for me to invest in spending, a, you know, half a decade writing a book, right? There's sufficient incentives. I don't have to capture it all, right? There's lots of ideas I don't own open infrastructure you can all use, make use of in a variety of different ways. I hope you do, right? That's good for me, it's good for you, it's a win-win. We should look for win-win opportunities whenever we can. Uh, there's increasing inequality income-wise and there's a digital divide. Um, if that trend continues, what are the implications for quality of public infrastructure and the support for public infrastructure. Say, say part of it, public, you said the part pu of the... Public support, uh, support in general for public infrastructure, and is there going to be unequal, unequal access to quality infrastructure, whether it's physical or virtual? Right, so one way in which infrastructure, so I had mentioned like the one way you can prioritize infrastructure investments based on user communities. Right? There are some communities that aren't worth investing in. So, I mean, one way of thinking about equality of infrastructure, you know, equality of access to various infrastructures, or there's insufficient investment in certain communities, is that the, the private market doesn't see those opportunities as worthwhile investments. Um, and so uh, that triggers, in my mind, sort of just a, one of the, that takes us into the supply side. It, it's demand driven in the sense that there's not sufficient demand to make the investment worthwhile from a market perspective. Um, and it leads you to some, some of the classic supply side problems. How do we deal with it from the supply side? But yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, to the, uh, so one, one thing you guys might like about this book, whether it's something that's in there that connects with your point, is that um, I try to make the case that equality, the sort of broad public capabilities are valuable 
not just for justice, equity, or fairness reasons, but also for efficiency reasons. We're all better off when more people are, in fact, capable of being productive. Whether or not they choose to exercise that capability is a different question. But um, so there's actually positive welfare gains to, uh, to in making those kinds of investments to make access more equal. It's not just a fairness question. But yeah, I think it's both. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. I think um, we all had a lot of fun, learned a lot. And you got me worried. She went up to get the microphone. I thought she was going to say, what are that net neutrality rules too soon? <laughs> and then 10 years we'll have you back again for the next big book. <laughs> thank you. Or hopefully earlier. Thanks.